Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Karen Mann, uh, the host for this webinar, along with my co-partner, Sadita Hassi. And I have uh, with me uh, uh, Richard Uphoff uh, with, with an awesome topic today, which I'm uh, personally looking forward to listen to him as well. We represent the Human Development and Leadership Division of the American Society for Quality. This is a global division aiming to enrich the personal and professional lives of our members and non-members across the global community. We continuously look for new speakers within the range of our body of knowledge, which can be found in my ASQ HDNL community site. We host monthly webinars, and if you are interested or if you know of anyone that is interested, uh, Sadita and I would be happy to have a review of the application. Before we begin this webinar, let's go over some webinar rules. If there is any question or comment, please type your question in the question tab, which you will find on the very right side of your screen. And we will be happy to answer the questions as we go along. And we will have a 15 minutes time in the very end for a question answers directly with Mr. Richard today. Those of you who attend 40 minutes will receive 0.1 CEU through an email, which you can save and use to claim your credit with ASQ. ASQ. So we're very delighted to introduce you to our guest speaker for tonight and use this hour to reflect on the topic uh, that Richard has for us. What's the love got to do with it? Richard Afholf is an operations manager and registered principal with the Vanguard Group in Scottsdale, Arizona. He has worked in financial services for 28 years and is an expert in lead deployment and an execution in service organization. He is an ASQ certified manager of quality and a quality engineer. He's also a member leader of ASQ and currently serving as the chair elect for the human development and leadership division and is also working with a small team to create a new financial service division within ASQ. He lives with his wife and daughter in Fountain Hills, Arizona. Richard, very, very happy to have you here today and, and the floor is all yours. I look forward to listen to you for the next 45 minutes. Okay, thank you, Kieran. I really appreciate it. Can you hear me okay? Is the audio yeah, coming through we're all okay? Good. Okay, great. Well, thank you uh, and thanks, Kieran. Thanks, Sadita. I know Sadita is calling in from, from Europe, so uh, I think we've worked through the tech issues that we had in our little test run, but uh, uh, let me just say a welcome to all of you. I'm so glad to be here. I'm so glad to see many of you attending. It looks like we have 130 plus people on the call here. So um, we're going to take a, a quick poll here at the very beginning. Uh, let me just say a few words of introduction and then we'll do the poll and then we'll get into the presentation. So um, uh, first off, just thanks again to Kieran and Sadita, they are our webinar chairs and they have helped to ensure that these things go smoothly and have worked very hard from outside the US to make sure that um, that no matter where you're calling in from, this has been a smooth presentation. So thanks to both of you. Um, and, and thanks to all of the attendees on the call today because I know that um, you know, there's other things you could be doing with your time uh, right now, uh, but you've chosen to invest your time to learn about this topic, and I appreciate that. Um, and uh, as Kieran said, if I manage my time right, we should be done with about 15 minutes for questions at the end. But feel free to pop any other questions into the into the question box, and we'll monitor those and make sure that we get to those at the end. Um, and then I'll I'll, I'll just say uh, one other word here. Um, you'll see uh, some branding on the screen for uh, ASQ and for the 20th uh, Lean Six Sigma conference. So um, even though today is March the 10th, uh, this is actually a presentation I did last week at the 20th uh, Lean Six Sigma conference that usually would be held here in Arizona. But in this year, uh, last week, it was actually all digital or all virtual. Um, but this is the same conference, and I just didn't get a chance to change the branding on the slides. But because this is all through ASQ, and because you're members of the division uh, and members of ASQ, um, uh, we feel good in kind of rolling this rolling this out to this group. So, um, 
Okay, so uh, I'm going to give a word here uh, in introduction uh, in just a moment. But first, we wanted to do a quick little poll because I'm curious to know who all is in the audience and what your roles are. So we have a basically a question that just asks: Are you um, are you either a, a frontline leader, are you a leader of leaders, or are you an individual contributor? Uh, we took this um, we took this poll last week at the ASQ conference, at the Lean Six Sigma conference. I also did a presentation at last year's conference on leader standard work, and I took a similar poll. Uh, but we're curious to know, um, we're curious to know just who's out in the audience, what your primary role is, so that we can help create content as a division that, that meets your needs. I think when we did this last week, uh, we had about 50% of the audience were individual contributors, and then the other half the audience were uh, either frontline leaders or or leaders of leaders. So Kieran, I'll just wait for a cue from you when we think the uh, the polling is done. Correct. Thank you, Richard. Uh, the, the voting is going on right now. I'm just going to give them a few more seconds. We're at 75 percent of um, attendees that have voted and the trend looks like the same one you got last week. Can already see 50 okay. percent an individual. So okay, let's great. give it another five, six seconds, and then I will close the poll. So if anybody is still uh, taking a little bit of time, please go ahead and uh, share your opinion. Yeah, and like I said, this helps uh, us as a leadership team for the Human Development and Leadership Division understand what sort of content might be applicable. Um, but as you'll hear me say in my presentation, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're a frontline leader or a leader of leaders or an individual contributor, these are skills and this is uh, soft skills, so to speak, that could benefit anyone, right? Just understanding your own emotional intelligence, understanding your own emotions can be helpful uh, no matter what your role is. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. So, um, Richard, they should be able to see it now. And uh, the trend is 47% individual, uh, individual contributors, and 35% are frontline, and 18 is leader of leaders. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Let me go back to my. Oops. There you go. Okay. I gotta get back to my screen here. Where did it go? Uh, where did my presentation go? <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, that's not. That's my. Uh, yeah, but. Uh, can you? Uh, there you go. Hmm. Well, um, shoot. Uh, let me see here. Can you, what, are you seeing my desktop right now? I'm seeing your desktop. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Richard is just looking at uh, um, his presentation, which we seem to have uh, kind of lost for a second. I would encourage everybody to Think about the questions that you had in mind, meanwhile, uh, and um, take the time to- Richard, I'm sharing my screen, if you would like that. Oh, no, great, I think thank you. He's back. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm the presenter. It's my screen, uh, Kiran. Okay. So just tell me where to go and I'll do that the for you. The next slide. And Kiran, okay. please just take the questions and I'll share the screen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, before we click to the next slide here, I'm going to say one other word. Thank you, uh, Sadita, for quickly pivoting over to that. I don't know. I must. I don't know. I lost no my <laughs> screen here. Um, okay. So just a, a quick word here of introduction, right? So as um, as Karen pointed out, I've got this title here. What's love got to do with it? And I'm, uh, I'm sort of intentionally getting your uh, getting your attention um, because this is a you know a famous. Tina Turner song from the 1980s. Um, 
But I put this up here in order to get your attention, but also be, to show that we oftentimes think of um, these things in opposites, right? That either you either you are uh, emotional or you're analytical, right? We think of them as uh, diametrically opposed and mutually exclusive. But what I hope to show in the course of this presentation is that that's not the case, right? That we sometimes think in these uh, these opposites. Um, but but as I'll show here in, in just a minute, um, uh, you'll see that that's that's really not the case. But but first, I want to start with a story. And so um, up on the screen here is Captain James Livingston, and Captain Livingston uh, was the platoon commander of Second Battalion, Fourth Marines in the in in Vietnam. And in 1970, he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor by President Richard Nixon for events that actually occurred on May the 2nd, uh, 1968. And it was on that day that his team, his team of Marines was told to assault a village on the far side of a very large rice paddy. And the previous night, um, an enemy force had moved into this village, taken over the village and fortified it with weapons. Um, and in the process of doing so, trapped another Marine unit on the far side of that village. And so Captain Livingston, was told, was given orders to assault that village so that they could help uh, free the uh, Marines that were trapped on, on the other side. And so Captain Livingston and his men, in order to assault this village, had to cross 500 yards of open rice paddy. Now, for those of you that have seen pictures of rice paddies or been in rice paddies, you know, you can envision this it's just an open marsh, essentially. There's no protection. It's a low, shallow lagoon. You know, it's punctuated with the occasional kind of walkway or earthen dike, um, but it's essentially uh, 500 yards of, of open, uh, open terrain with no cover, no protection whatsoever. And his, he had to take his Marines across this open area to assault this village. And think about that, right? Like he's 28 years old and he's leading a team of Marines and he's got to um, make his way across 500 yards of open terrain while with uh, the enemy on the other side who is intent on killing him and his team and his men, right? So nonetheless, he, he gathers his troops and they move out and in the process of crossing the rice paddy, uh, Captain Livingston is wounded not once but twice uh, in the leg and in the arm. And once he and his team, uh, what was left of his team, got to the other side, he was actually wounded in the process of actually assaulting the village, was wounded a third time. And, and it was only after no longer being able to walk that he allowed himself to be tended to and, and evacuated um, by, the, by the medics, right? So think about that. Again, he's 28 years old and he is uh, now been wounded three times. He was able to overcome fear. He was able to push past the sense of panic that would have overwhelmed most of us, right? Most other people, right? And he was able to persist through this, this overwhelming pain, maybe even sadness or shock as he's trying to accomplish the mission. And he just kept going, right? And all at this young age of 28. Now, I don't know about you, but I know how I was at 28 years old, and I don't know that I, I could have done that, right? But he was just able to overcome so much, right? So now fast forward 14 years, and I, um, I'm a young private in the Marines myself going through boot camp at Paris Island. And Captain Livingston had then, by then, been promoted to Lieutenant Colonel, and he was my battalion commander as I went through recruit training. And one day, my platoon and I were out for a run, a formation run, and I will never forget to this day, I will never forget the sight of him uh, with these deep, deep scars all up and down his legs. And I only saw him, I met him once during an inspection briefly and saw him from afar on that other time while we were running. And But I will never forget the sight of those scars on his legs and seeing him running alongside of us uh, just, uh, just like one of us. Um, so what does this have to do with emotional intelligence? Well, it's two things really. The first is, you know, even though I only met him briefly uh, all those years ago, almost 40 years now, that image of him has stuck with me all these years, right? And hearing the story, knowing the story um, has really uh, kept with me um, all, this, all this time. And whenever I feel, you know, 
sorry for myself or I feel like I can't go on. I think back to the story of him and seeing him out there running with us in the same sort of shorts and running shoes that the rest of us were in. And yet he was doing it after having gone through all, all that he did. Uh, the second reason um, that I bring this up, right, is that in the years since he was awarded this honor, um, we have learned a lot about PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and then the lesser known phenomena, what positive psychology calls post-traumatic stress growth. And in this case, you know, and with post-traumatic stress growth, right, we know now that in the face of some traumatic events, some people are actually able to grow and thrive from these events. And this was clearly the case with Captain Livingston because he went on to serve another 27 years in the Marine Corps after those horrific events of that day in May, 1968. He was able to have a very successful career, uh, 33 years of service in total, and he retired in 1995 as a, as a major general. So clearly he was, while some people may have been uh, succumbed to the stress and the uh, problems and the wounds and the drama of that event, he was able to uh, thrive and, and succeed and have a very, very successful career. Uh, and like I said, ultimately retiring after, after 33 years. So, um, okay, next slide, please, Sadita. So, um, so that's what this has to do with emotional intelligence. So we have a couple of learning objectives today and keeping in the theme um, with so many other of the ASQ presentations, we do want you to walk away with some action items. We want you to walk away with some tangible things that you can do to put into action. But, but before we get there, I have a couple of other learning objectives for today. First is just to understand what is emotional intelligence and how to recognize it in yourself. And secondly, um, to really just gain a better understanding of the links between emotional intelligence and lean as a particular subset of, of quality. Uh, you know, this is a very exciting time to be talking about this stuff. We have, we've had unprecedented discoveries in brain science. We're entering the decade that some people call the decade of self-awareness. You know, we're in the midst of this global pandemic. We have remote relationships and remote work, and it's all the more reason to understand emotional intelligence. So again, I'm thankful that you're spending this time with us today to learn more about this. Um, um, but at the best, this can really just be an introduction to you. You know, there have been countless books and research that has been done on this topic in the last several decades. Um, but if you only get one thing out of this, it is that we hope, Sadita and Kieran and I hope that you can get better at, we hope that you understand after hearing this presentation that you can get better at this, right? So if you only get one thing out of this presentation, uh, it is that you can get better at this. You can improve in, in these areas with your emotional intelligence. And at the end, we'll have a sp some specific things that you can actually do to enhance your own intelligence and, and that of those around you. Uh, okay, next slide. So before we get started you know, into the weeds even more, we need to kind of level set, create a good, strong foundation. Uh, and so what is emotional intelligence, right? The word emotion actually comes from the Latin word that means to move or to move out of. And you think about what we say in English anyway, uh, you know, that really moved me or I was really moved by uh, this event or that person, right? So again, from the Latin word meaning actually to move. And scientists today would say, psychologists today would say that there are four basic emotions. There's fear, anger, sadness, and joy, right? Those are the four. Um, but um, when you think about being intelligent about those emotions, like how does that really break down? And it breaks down kind of in these five ways. The first is just knowing knowing your own emotions, right? Like having that sense of self-awareness to know whether you're fearful or scared, whether you're angry or mad or whether you're sad or happy, right? The second thing is to then, you know, once you're aware of it, like how do you manage it, right? You know, uh, how do you manage your own emotions or are you managed by your own emotions, right? Some people are just managed by their emotions. Some people can actually manage their emotions proactively and understand um, how to change their emotions or how to change their behavior to affect their emotions, right? So that's the second part. The third part is really motivating yourself, right? Like harnessing those emotions to um, uh, get a job done, right? To push through a deadline, to um, do things, do hard things when the going gets tough, right? It's that sense of grit, 
to help accomplish a mission or finish a project or uh, get through you know some tough times right like it's harnessing those emotions to really motivate yourself when you don't really feel like it um, fourth it's really recognizing the emotions in others right so the first three are about looking inward the fourth and the fifth are really about looking outward and that is about recognizing the emotions in others um, can you have that same sense of um, you know is this other person happy or sad or angry or scared um, and then lastly, like, okay, now that you've recognized emotions in others, how do you, what do you do with that? How do you navigate the emotional life of those others? How do you handle relationships with other people between you and other people, whether it's a spouse or a boyfriend, girlfriend, or a family member or a team or your boss or people that report to you or people you work with, right? Once you can recognize those emotions in other people, it's then how do you navigate those relationships. Uh, so th those are the five pieces, the five parts, or the things that make up emotional intelligence. Now let's kind of go to some history behind this idea. Um, so, you know, in putting this um, presentation together, um, I, I sort of started this timeline with uh, Charles Darwin's book in 1872. Um, this actually, this book came about after his groundbreaking book on the origin of the species. Um, but he, in 1872, he came out with a book called The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animal. And it really kind of built upon the work that he had done on the origin of the species. But he covered in this book on emotions, what we would today call body language, right? Or nonverbal communication. And that was really the focus of, of this book. Um, but it was interesting that, you know, it was, uh, it started, the book started as a series of self-reflections in his own, in Darwin's own journal on his own emotional state, uh, because he was reflecting on the emotions that he had gone through after uh, publishing The Origin of the Species and how it was affecting him, the, the uh, attention that he received from that groundbreaking book and how it affected him. He started to write it in the journal and it led to this subsequent, subsequent book. But Fast forward uh, many years to 1905, um, when Lewis Terman, who was at Stanford University, created the Stanford Binet Test of General Intelligence, and this was really an attempt to uh, gain an understanding of, you know, how do how are people intelligent about things and intelligent, and it was a general assessment of intelligence. But what what's interesting about the Stanford Binet Test, which is in some respects still used today, uh, um, almost 100 years later but actually more than 100 years later, but the Stanford Binet test was really used um, as a precursor to the recruiting efforts in the United States um, uh, leading up to World War I and the U.S. involvement in World War I. And so the U.S. military used the Stanford Binet test to try to put people into the right jobs for, you know, what was at that time the largest recruiting effort on behalf of the U.S. military um, at the time. But um, you know, again, it was used um, largely for World War I and then also continued use after World War I into World War II, again, predominantly in the US um, for um, identifying you know, these recruits who were coming into the US military and what would be the ideal job, what would be the right job for the right person at, at that time. And, and that was the model for, for decades um, and then after, in the wake of World War II and the scientific develop, developments that led to the atomic bomb, that same technology was used in the 70s to create the first MRI body scan that was performed on a human being. And what this allowed scientists to do is to actually peer into the brain and see what parts of the brain were lighting up um, with activity when certain things were happening happening in the world around the, the patient. And so it was the first time that we were able to actually look inside the brain and see how it, how it uh, generated energy and how that energy moved as people experienced different emotions. But it wasn't really until the 1980s when Howard Gardner challenged, Howard Gardner was teaching uh, education at Harvard University and he really challenged this idea from the Stanford Binet test that there is only one general intelligence, right? So the general IQ test had been used for almost 80 years by the time, or, or close to 90, uh, actually about 80 years by the time Howard Gardner wrote his book. Um, 
but it was this book that really, even though the idea of emotional intelligence came about before Gardner's book, it was Gardner's book that really brought it to the popular press because that book, Frames of Mind, really outlined um, more than just general intelligence. He outlined several other types of intelligence, which I'll kind of list for here in, in just a minute. But he outlined it was the first time that anybody had really articulated um, uh, something more than just a, a general intelligence. Um, and um, and I put that on here because this was a largely the popular press that the ideas started really taking a much more mainstream appeal. And then in the 1990s, um, Daniel Goldman, um, who was a journalist and a researcher and a psychologist by training, uh, wrote a book specifically on this topic, emotional intelligence. And uh, but the reason why I put his next book, uh, his 2002 book, Primal Leadership, on here is because, for purposes of this audience, or, or at least um, you know close to half of this audience, um, his 2002 book, Goldman's 2002 book, Primal Leadership, was really about how do you uh, how do you attach, uh, how do you connect emotional intelligence with leadership, right? Because uh, leaders can have effect on their own. Uh, leaders need to be able to manage their own emotions, and leaders can have a positive and a negative effect on the emotions of the people they're leading, too. And that was the big um, uh, takeaway or the big uh, um, kind of uh, discovery uh, outlined in his book. Um, okay, next slide, please. So um, mentioning uh, Howard Gardner again, the frames of mind, right? So what he did in his book was to outline some other forms of intelligence, right? Which included in his book, you know, verbal intelligence, right? Which is what you often uh, see in writers and poets and certain artists or other uh, speakers, pub public speakers. Uh, there was a quantitative or symbolic reasoning, um, sensory intelligence, motor intelligence, or kinesthetic intelligence, which is what you'll see with athletes, especially professional athletes. They have a very high degree of motor intelligence and how their body moves through space. Um, and, and practical intelligence, in addition to just general intelligence. But you know, since that time, since the 1990s, we've also learned a lot um, about you know, other things, right? Especially uh, recently about the microbiome, right? Uh, the so-called gut bacteria or the gut brain and how the foods you eat can influence your mood, right? And scientists are now discovering uh, about the bacteria that, um, that survives and thrives in the human uh, digestive tract and how that can really have an effect, that that microbiome or that bacteria can really have an effect on, on your mood and your well-being as a result. But we've also uh, had much uh, greater um, discoveries into how emotions link to employee engagement, to business results, especially now during this time of the pandemic, uh, how emotions link to productivity, um, and how emotions link to well-being costs to organizations. And then uh, lastly here, just you know, very recently, uh, discovering ways um, to hack the autonomic nervous system, which is where you know the seat of emotions in the human brain. Um, that we've uh, there have been several efforts underway, a lot of uh, early research that's being done uh, on how to do that, how to hack your autonomic nervous system. Um, so why is this important? We'll go to the next slide, and I'll talk about some things like, okay, well, so what? Like, why why should we care about this stuff? Um, well, first off, quite obviously. If you can manage your own emotions, it can help you be happy, right? It can help you uh, think positively. It can help you understand what gets you down. Um, and it helps you get more done from a practical standpoint. You know, if you can have a high degree of uh, grit or a high degree of, um, you know, internal or intrinsic motivation, you can just get more done. You can push past those times when you want to quit something or stop a project or get bogged down with something so it helps your own personal productivity it also makes life easier for those around you right because if you're uh, positive and you can manage your own emotions you can help uh, be a positive influence on other people again whether it's your family or your loved ones or your friends or your co-workers uh, it also makes for stronger teams either if you're a leader of a team or you are a contributing member of a team um, you can set a good example and it can help the team get done because as people have a degree of emotional intelligence. There's also been a lot of work on emotional intelligence of groups of people and how that can be influenced by their leader, but also by the members of the team. 
and for any of those for those of you who are leaders right like team building this is why team building is so important to create that sense of an emotional awareness at the team level um and then also obviously uh, people bring their emotions to work regardless right like if you uh, if you're undergoing some personal trauma or some personal uh, setback you know that's going to affect your work you know if you uh if you uh, lose a loved one right or you fall in love or you fall out of love or um you have some personal trauma uh you're gonna bring that into the workplace and so we as co-workers and we as leaders have to recognize that we can't just expect people to turn off their emotions when they walk in the door especially now that the lines between work and home have been blurred as we've been all working from home for these last uh, 12 months. Um, and then I just say is the last thing here because it's the right thing to do, especially as a leader, right? It gives that moral imperative as a leader that we have a moral obligation to the people that we are leading. But, and here's the punchline, none of this will work unless you act on it. And we'll come back to that idea at the end here. So I mentioned this autonomic nervous system. Uh, and so this slide really is just a picture of the brain right and the parts of the brain and some of this really has only come about recently that we've even had a good sense of what this uh, even looks like uh, within our own skull um but for those of you that you know are not aware right the brain evolved from the bottom up it's sort of that purple brain stem region at the very bottom of the picture here it it the brain evolved over eons from the bottom up so the base of that is the oldest part of the brain it's called also called the reptilian brain or the lizard brain and that's the house that's the seat of the limbic system right so that's the autonomic nervous system it's the part of you that just runs on on autopilot it's what keeps you breathing without thinking about it it's what keeps your food being digested without having to think about it right it's that automatic part of your uh you know your human organism that just runs uh, by itself without you having to consciously think about it. But here's the thing, right? The emotional mind can actually react faster than the thinking brain. Like if I, if I sneak up on you and I startle you, it's that amygdala at the base of your brain that's gonna fire faster than you can think about it and faster than the uh, executive part of your brain can tell you to jump. Right? Again, if I sneak up on you and I scare you or I startle you, you're going to move, right? You're going to move suddenly without even thinking about it or without even realizing what happened. Um, and that's because that amygdala can send a, um, at the speed of light, basically, can send that, um, that hormonal reaction to get your muscles to move. Uh, it's that fight or flight response. In this case, it's the, it's the, the flight that causes you to jump. Um, and um, I'll just tell a quick story. I had a meditation practice a few years ago, and I was sitting very quietly. I used to do it early in the morning in our house in Virginia, and I was sitting quietly in the dark house where I practiced, and I actually um, had been doing it for a couple of months, and I heard the newspaper getting delivered to our front door, and the newspaper carrier threw, threw the paper at the front door. It was like an aluminum screen door, hit it with such force that it caused this loud bang. Well, normally that would have startled me, but what I distinctly remember from that, um, from that occasion was feeling the electrical impulse um, running straight up my spine uh, to the base of my brain, right? So this is what, it, what we're talking about when you're able to sort of slow this emotional system down or slow this reaction down, that's the kind of uh, effect that you might might have, right? So uh, this amygdala, right, which is at the base of, of the brain, the oldest part of the brain, is responsible for secreting, secreting um, the stress home hormone adrenaline or noradrenaline, right, that science is linked to things like PTSD or chronic stress, right? So that's, it's the amygdala that, that, um, that secretes that hormone. And it's, you know, certain memories, especially longer term memories, are housed there at the base of that brain. And that's why PTSD, when it is triggered, um, is so deep-seated in a lot of individuals that it requires medication or some sort of um, strong intervention, therapeutic intervention to really overcome um, that, um, that, you know, that kind of triggered response. But, but here's the thing, right? Some emotional responses start automatically and end here, right? Because they are uh, triggered by that autonomic nervous system. But there are other emotional um, uh, contexts that evolve more slowly right 
um, because they may build up here in the amygdala, but then they are released, those horm hormones are released to the frontal part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, um, which is where our executive, the decision-making part of our brain uh, is housed. And so even though the emotion may start, the emotion of love or the emotion of fear may start there, if it can make its way to the frontal part of the brain and we can sort of think about it, right, or decide about it, um, that's when we can now start to have control over our emotions and over how it may control other parts of our behavior. So let me give you an example. We can go to the next slide here. So I'll just give you an example to kind of make this uh, make this real for everybody. So I'm going to take you back over a year ago, um, and this is just one example from my personal experience of the emotions of one particular day and how it manifested itself with a dream that actually led to the creation of this very presentation. So uh, I'm going to take you back to the 19th annual Lean Six Sigma conference. So last year's uh, Six Sigma conference it was February of 2020. Uh, I was there. I was also presenting. I was excited to be there because it was the first time I was ever presenting at that conference. Uh, but the day began with a keynote speaker, a guy by the name of Kaplan Mowbray, super dynamic uh, speaker. He's um, very energetic. He's an athlete himself. He's up on stage during his introduction. He's doing push-ups on stage. He's playing the saxophone for the audience. He's running around the room with a microphone. Right, so just a super dynamic, super positive presentation. And one of the things that he had us do as an audience was to text someone important to us and ask the following question. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of me, right? So he had all the participants in the office pull out our phones, text somebody that was close to us, coworker or loved one or whatever, and just say, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of me? And so I texted my wife, who was the first person I thought of, and, I, and she replied to me with a text message, uh, just one word, and it was love, right? With a little heart emoji, right? And so with that, right? So, you know, if uh, Kaplan's uh, energetic uh, and enthusiastic and athletic presentation and opening keynote got our endorphins um, uh, flowing, right? Because endorph endorphin is the, uh, is the, uh, the hormone that is released when you're uh, exercising, right? then the text message released oxytocin. Oxytocin is also called the cuddle hormone. It's the hormone of uh, feeling good. You know, when you're kissing a loved one or when you're hugging someone, right? That's the hormone that is released in the brain to reinforce that positive uh, sensation or that positive feeling. And in this case, uh, when I got that response, saw that response from my wife, you know, that's, uh, that's what happened. And then later that evening, I went home and I watched with my daughter the uh, one of the last episodes of a show um, called The Bachelor. If any of you have seen that, it was sort of the penultimate or the culminating uh, episode where he decided uh, who he was going to choose, right? So I'm there on the couch watching it with somebody I care about, my daughter, somebody I love. And we're watching a nice uh, kind of feel-good story of uh, uh, how this guy... Uh, you know, was courted by or courted these young women and how he chose the one who really spoke to his heart to be his wife. Uh, so it was a really good feeling and, and it was the sense of uh, dopamine, right? Dopamine is the, uh, the positive uh, hormone again that is released when we, have, um, when we have positive things happen, right? Positive things happen. Um, but then later that night, right, my wife, who at the time was the president of our local parent-teacher organization, and they were just days away from putting on their annual gala, uh, and she was um, uh, at the center of some of the planning, and so she's under a lot of stress trying to make sure that the evening comes off without a hitch. And she is, um, when you're under stress, right, it generates this sense of cortisol, like the hormone of cortisol, which is the uh, stress hormone. Um, and so that was sort of experience at the end of the day. Well, all this was my kind of emotional and hormonal experience throughout the day. So then that night I went to sleep and I was awakened in the middle of the night uh, from a dream, which uh, the basis of which was this presentation here and talking about this, uh, this uh, in this way. Um, so just again, another personal example to, uh, to show uh, how these things can connect for you because it's often at night when our brains are uh, processing the inputs of the day, the behaviors of the day, 
the, um, the stimuli of the day. It's at night when our brains are, are um, not, I won't say resting because our brains are actually quite active when we're sleeping. Uh, that's the time when your brain processes these emotions and tr puts them in a context, links the memories that are associated or built on that day, links them the prior memories, and then helps uh, helps you recall. Well, it was that night that I had the idea for this uh, for this presentation. All right, but let's take this one step further and let's connect it to business, right? Because um, uh, we want to help bring value back to our companies or back to our teams or our projects. So um, my company, the Vanguard Group. Um, as um, as Kieran mentioned at the beginning, I'm in financial services, and we are undergoing now three years into a, a lean uh, transformation. And so I am uh, very much involved in a lot of these lean activities. And so this table helps show how uh, the domain of the domains of emotional intelligence can connect to certain lean activities. And questions you can ask as a coworker or a project lead or a team lead or a manager. Uh, to help enhance your own emotional intelligence um, in that lean activity or or that of those around you. So let's just talk through a couple of these here. So uh, leader standard work. As I mentioned, my presentation at last year's lean conference was on leader standard work. Well, leader standard work is all about um, is all about um, uh, um, maintaining the gains that have been made through your improvement efforts, right? And so when you're doing that, right, it's all about your own uh, schedule, your own time management, your ability to manage your own time, your ability to um, manage your time effectively. Um, that's what leader standard work is about if you are a leader. And so you have to be able to manage your own emotions and know when you're feeling under stress because maybe you're behind schedule on something. Or if you're in the midst of a project and you might, you know, run up against a brick wall or a roadblock, you know, pushing past that, motivating yourself to push past that. So some questions might be like, how are you spending your time, right? Because frontline workers or individual contributors might have standard work that is dictated by the process or dictated by the business, but what do leaders have? Leaders have their schedule, it's how they reinforce some of these improvements that are made by the frontline crew, and then coaching, right? Coaching their crew. So they may say, well, what are your priorities in your schedule? And are your pri do you need to change your priorities? Um, some other examples here, like coaching kata, that's a, a, a very obvious example, right? Because in coaching kata, right, when you are one-on-one -on -one with somebody, you've entered the uh, workspace or the work um, area of, of somebody, and, and you're one-on-one -on -one with them, and you're trying to help them get better through question asking. And so there, now you're, the, the other person's emotional state is entering into um, your field of view or field of vision if you're a leader. Um, if you're not a leader, right, if you're a, a, an individual contributor, you know, you may participate in a daily huddle, right, or in a, what we call an accountability meeting, right, where you're expected to read out on how much you got done or, you know, how much you got done in relation to how much you hope to have gotten done, right? If you said, hey, my goal was to, um, you know, um, was to make uh, 20 widgets uh, yesterday and I only made 18 widgets, right? Uh, in the daily huddle, that's when you would, um, you know, kind of explain, here's what got in my way. And you have to manage your emotions um, throughout that process. And then about, you know, checking in on the pulse of the team, whether you're a leader or a coworker, you know, if, especially if you can help others out to accomplish their goals for the business. Um, that can be a way of really understanding um, the emotional state of others. Okay, so again, here's some examples. Um, um, I want to be mindful of the time here. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, uh, Sidita. Cool. Thanks um, so much, Richard. I know there is a couple of more slides left, and uh, I, I do want to make sure that we are taking questions. So please feel free to use the question box and start submitting your questions. This way we can use this uh, last 10 to 15 minutes um, directing you to that uh, uh, in that regard. So please keep using it. Uh, we do have some questions coming, so we'll, we can go ahead, Richard, for now, but we, we do need to close um, this part in about five minutes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so on the next slide, really, this is where the rubber meets the road, as we say, right? Because we want to make this practical. We want you to have some tangible takeaway um, and and realize that, you know, 
this stuff may feel hard, but it's really um, not hard once you look at this list. I'm not going to go through all 10 things here. You know, you can take a screenshot of this or you can take a, uh, if you um, reach out to me through LinkedIn or reach out to Sadita or Kieran. We, um, we will we share, go. just so they know, we will share the presentation on my ASQ uh, community page and we'll also share the recording uh, on our YouTube page. So thanks for reminding Perfect. that, Richard. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I'll just touch on a couple of these here. I'll touch on some of the easy ones, like just breathing, right? <laughs> You know, we all do that. It's all part of our autonomic nervous system, right? We don't have to think about it. But if you do think about it and you do notice it, um, you can have an immediate impact on your emotional state by just focusing on your own breathing. Some people do this through a formal meditation practice. Some people do it through athletics or some sort of physical activity. But a lot of times, especially if we're all sitting hunched over our computer throughout the day, um, we can develop a lot of tension in our um, thoracic spine, in our chest, right, which can affect your breathing, right? It can make your breathing very shallow, which can then affect your emotional state. Because if your breathing becomes very shallow, you can feel stressed and under pressure. A lot of times, if you feel under pressure and that cortisol is sort of coursing through your brain, one way to relieve it is to just take a deep breath, right? Or take a series of deep breaths. One easy way is to just deep breathe in to a count of four and breathe out to a count of four. Or if you really wanna relax, you breathe into a count of four and breathe out to a count of five, right? If you wanna just balance, just count to five as you're breathing in and then count to five as you're breathing out. That's an easy way to kind of immediately relax, uh, relax your, um, your body and then relax your emotional state, right? So that's one easy thing that we can do. Once you get into some of the more advanced things like getting 360 degree feedback, so getting feedback from your boss, getting feedback from people that report to you if you are a boss, and then getting feedback from uh, coworkers, so I like that can be a very effective um, way to gain that self-awareness, right? Um, there's a list of articles here on the next slide or books um, that we won't go into now, but um, that's a, another great place to start. There's a lot of, what's great is, especially with Daniel Goldman, he's really sort of the, one of the first experts in this area. And a lot of his information is available for free on Harvard Business Review. You go to Harvard Business Review's website and you can download some of his articles for free. Um, and that'll give you a really good uh, introduction, more than we could do today um, in, this, um, in this area. But I would just say pick, you know, pick one of those things, right? Just pick one because I would challenge you to challenge yourself, right? Um, just pick one of these and, and try it, right? And, and if you don't act on one of these things, then it's just going to wind up being some interesting information uh, that you heard at a webinar, right? So that's why you, you, you just have to act and you have to um, uh, take some action on on one of these things. You know, keeping a journal is another easy thing to do. Just write down, um, you know, what goes through your mind. A lot of people will keep a gratitude journal or a dream journal or just a daily journal. That's a super easy way to just become much more aware of your emotional state and how it may change throughout the day, especially if you keep the journal uh, like in the morning and then again at night. Um, so, uh, as I said, um, you know, we had the Works Cited page. One thing that I'll just point out real quick and then we'll wrap up here. Uh, one of the books, um, there is a book by a, another Harvard professor named Amy Cuddy. Uh, she had a book out a couple years ago called Presence. And uh, uh, the big insight from Amy Cuddy's book is that just changing the way you sit or the way you stand can alter your mood. She does, she describes what she calls the Superman or Superwoman pose. Um, to actually affect the hormonal balance in your body and also affect your mood, right? By just changing your posture, changing the way you stand or sit can have an immediate impact on how you feel about yourself and how you feel about those around you. So I'll just put a, put a plug in for her book. But again, uh, our final call to action is just that and a thank you. So let me just close by saying thank you for your attention. Thank you for um, spending uh, part of your day with us here. Um, and again, just pick one idea. Take a micro step. Um, it's as easy as breathing. Um, and, and that's all that it takes. But again, thank you. And I guess um, Sadita and Kieran, we can uh, turn to the questions that are coming in now.
Thank you, Richard. I'm uh, very happy to have you here. I wasn't in the first uh, part of this. As you saw, our connection was having some issues. So thank you to everyone who was able to, to stay a bit longer today. And um, that will trigger some emotional intelligence on our side too. So <laughs> I'm glad we sometimes go through this. It's uh, very interesting what you say uh, about pick one and try it out. I personally believe that we, we function differently. So we all look forward for those magic rules. Uh, but this, at the end of the day, as you're saying, we do need to see what works for us uh, and be consistent with it. It's not just a one-time thing or just a webinar. Um, so some questions are coming and uh, let's see here. Uh, one of the questions uh, from Orlando in Brazil. So thanks for joining us from Brazil. Actually, let me see. Okay, here I am. Let's make it emotional. Talk. Uh, <laughs> yes, because your background is much more wiser than mine at this time. <laughs> um, so I feel like I want to come in that and, and steal some books. <laughs> Uh, so how is um, how do we find the balance between when do we need to be a lion and when do we need to be a lamb? He's saying uh, might be a bit situational as a situation, but what would you recommend or your personal experience with? Okay. Yeah, you know, um, it is an interesting question because uh, it it raises the idea, like you said, Sadita, of that situational awareness, right? The first, you know, as we went through those dimensions of human intelligence, right? One of the key words is awareness, right? And just knowing your own mental state, knowing um, the level of the mental state or emotional state of those around you, and then changing accordingly. Part of that is going to be determined by what is your role, right? If you're a spouse, right? If you're a family member. And that might be different than if you're a coworker. Uh, if you are an individual contributor, it might be different than if you are a leader, right? Because leaders, um, the reason why it's so important for leaders to manage their own emotional state is because you can have such a dramatic effect on the emotional state of the people you're leading, right? So if you come into work as a leader and you're depressed or you're down or you're angry, um, your team will experience that, your team will feel that, and your team will be affected by that, and their productivity will be affected by that. And you have to be aware of that as, as a leader. Um, it's what's called, what they call emotional contagion. Um, and there's a great article at Warden Business School mm -hmm. on this idea of emotional contagion, right? Because you as a leader can have a real detrimental effect on, um, you know, on those around you. Like you think about, um, think about my story at the beginning of Captain Livingston. If Captain Livingston, on that day in uh, 1968, if he had said to his team, oh, you know, this is too hard. Like, we're not going to be able to do this, right? Like, we, this is impossible. Exactly. We're all going to die, right? If we're all going to die. Like, if he had gone into it with that, you know, that would have had a very different outcome. <laughs> do you think, though, because we keep talking about leadership, and that's our focus, so we these topics are kind of uh, very repetitive, but... I feel we kind of need to clarify and maybe to take some sort of uh, self-accountability when we talk about leadership and not only expect that he's the leader, I'm not. So we kind of sometimes think of leadership as a manager. So he's the manager, so he's the leader. So I'm not responsible and accountable for my own emotional intelligence, which in my head, that's really, really risky. I do feel like we all, especially right now, which we're going on so much cross-functional type of jobs, we all should think of ourselves as a leader, as a person who, as you're saying, it's impacting other people you work with. It doesn't necessarily have to have a title, which is a, a higher grade or anything like that. So we kind of mm -hmm. have to take some self-control in that. And yeah. as yeah. I see this, go ahead, sorry. Well, I, I was just gonna say, that's a super important point, Sadita, because uh, two things. Number one, you know, you may not be a formal leader, but a lot of people exactly. who work in offices are informal leaders, informal. Right? so it may not be part of your title, but you may have some informal leadership influence on other people, right? So that's the first mm -hmm. thing. And the second thing is just what you said, right? Like I have a book down on the floor here called- That's Lead why when I come in that room and steal it. <laughs> it's called uh, Lead Self Before Leading Others, right? And so this, uh, there's this idea of, yeah, you may be an ind individual contributor, but you have to lead yourself first. And leading yourself means understanding your own emotions, understanding how to get the job done, even though you may not feel like it. So that's making me think of our 
not next webinar, but the other one as well in uh, May, which is about spiritual leadership. That's going to be pretty interesting as well. Uh, that kind of takes a view on what you're saying. Another question we have is emotional intelligence changing over time. How do we stabilize? Uh, keep going, I guess, <laughs> but we'll let you give your hints on that one. Yeah, this is, we think on yeah that's that's kind of a tricky one and i think that's why self-awareness is so important right because um you know different jobs um, elicit different responses from people and you know you get put into a very tough job and it might bring out the best in you and so you have to um you know when the inputs change the outputs have to change as well right so that's one way to think about it whether that input comes over time because mm -hmm. you're in a different company different job, different family, different role, whatever, you have to have that level of awareness to say, okay, how do I need to change based on this job, this country, this um, role, or this team? And um, talking about the situation we have here, which depends on circumstance, I guess this is a, an issue that all us change leaders kind of have as a, when it comes to a title as a quality leader, like you are it's certified, ASQ certified, and that's your title. And then you go out there and you try to do your job, which is changing. So it's not just about criticizing. One of those case here, it's, um, it's in Mexico, a company that uh, the person is trying to help the team actually make things better. And the feedback is that they feel they are criticized. Sometimes this role about either if it is a title as a quality leader or even just some person who wants to work proactively is seen as you are criticizing or what would you do in that uh, case to make it kind of a um, softer position? Well, a well, couple of things. One would be um, results matter, right? Results count. And so results often speak for themselves. So if the results are there, right? I mean, they can't come at just any cost. I think we have to be aware of the results and what the price is that we have to pay to get those results. So that's the kind of the first thing. Second thing I would say is, uh, you know, control what you can control. You know, you can't necessarily control what other people do or say, but you can control exactly. your own results and you can control what your team results are. Right. So that's the second thing. And I think the, the third thing I would say is that um, that's why um that one domain of understanding other people's emotions are so important right because mm -hmm. you have to be aware of that other person's mindset what their triggers might be what their um you know hot Motivates buttons them. might be exactly. and and all that and then how do you navigate that relationship because sometimes it takes you having to step back to reassess the relationship to then say okay i have to take a different approach I have to try a different way than what I had always been doing in order to mm -hmm. get my point to really sink in. And uh, I believe that what you're just saying about understanding, if either if it's a situation or the kind of person or the type of team or the type of task, uh, that's really, really important. I remember going through a lot of change management techniques from different authors, and uh, there were multiple philosophies and assumptions that these changes were made. So. And, and I was shocked to see that even like radical sort of change management technique was sometimes what was needed. Like, let's say there is a fusion between two companies. It's either take it or leave it approach. Or if it's a very, very risky situation uh, in, in that type of job and um, you're taking a lot of risk and making change happen and might take a lot of time and money, then people actually preferred um, taking uh, a yes or no decision from their own manager to say do it or don't do it. So they didn't want to take that chance to do it themselves. So there are multiple approaches there. I am um, see a pretty interesting question here. I find it difficult to describe my emotions. I'm going because it's a really interesting topic, but if you guys want to leave earlier, that's fine. Uh, we will share this presentation. Um, so next question is, how can I measure my uh, emotional um, Sorry, the other one was about describing the emotions. I have a difficulty in my own. I don't know if it's uh, about being afraid to be vulnerable or just a, an unawareness on how to describe it properly or a person who might not have had the experience to do it that before. If you can uh, elaborate on that question, but in the meantime, yeah. the floor it back. Yeah, you know, um, it's a fair question because um, 
uh, going back to the earlier comment that was asked about like how does it, it how how do we sh should we think about this as it changes over time right mm -hmm. and just as we get older we get more mature we become more aware of our do own <laughs> mentality as we get older right so that could be one thing but if you don't want to wait until you get to be mm -hmm. i eight right and you want to do it sooner than that um you know there are some good self assessments out there there are some good self assessments or emotional intelligence. Um, there are plenty mm -hmm. of free ones available. You can take one of those, and that can be a start to uh, to have a language or a, a terminology to use to, to use. describe your internal uh, dialogue, right? Because I, I think it's a fair, I've had that problem before as well. I think keeping mm -hmm. a journal can help too, because that can now start to open up how you describe things, how you describe certain mental states or how you describe certain emotional states, that can be a good way. And then reading, right? Like reading to, can expand your vocabulary about how other people describe the same thing that you may be feeling. Because part of the inability to describe it could be you just don't have the words to describe it, right? That could be one reason. The other reason could be, you know, you just don't have the level of self-awareness, right? That could be another reason and it will just come in time. Well, do you think about those companies? We actually had one of our members uh, sharing this. They had um, all employees go through these personality tests and things like I, I now blame it on personality tests. Every yeah. time I go out of my way, it's like, I'm that type of person. But only 2% of the world are these people, so I kind of self-motivate myself, but that's not the best way. I know this company specifically uses even cards with colors to on their desk so then when you go and approach that person you kind of know now i like it because i feel like it must it's gonna help me a lot to know how to approach the person at the same time i feel like our personalities are not i was reading this book about personality it's not uh, i have it right now in my audio book personality is not basically always the same so mm -hmm. wouldn't that define us and kind of be a bias sort of um Personality yeah. isn't permanent, actually. The book is from Benjamin Hardy. Uh, okay. From okay. Um, yeah, it's a it's a great point. It's a great question because, you know, in English we say nature versus nurture, right? Correct. And it's this idea of your biology versus your environment. And um, uh, there's another guy out of Harvard University, a guy by the name of Brian Little. He's a psychologist. He was actually a keynote speaker at the ASQ World Conference a couple of years ago, and he's a world expert on personality. And I won't get the exact number right, but what he says is that um, in this question of nature versus nurture, that really mm -hmm. only about 35 to 45% of your okay. attributes are genetic in nature. Right. The rest are influenced. <laughs> the rest are influenced by your environment and your behavior okay. and the inputs coming into you from the world around you. What you read, who you talk to, who you interact with, where you work, what your education is, um, where you live. Right. That mm -hmm. the majority of your traits are the result of your environment, as opposed to some genetic basis in your DNA or in your family or or whatever. So you know, they can be influenced over time. And then there's also the question of a genetic modification, right? That you can, you can, depending on how you behave, you can get genes to express differently um, over time through exercise, through diet, through behavior. Right? You can actually get your genes to express differently, which can then have an impact on your future self, on your offspring, all right? This is the power of this kind of nature nurture continuum. There is this book uh, I read from Tara Swart, uh, The Source. She was an MIT professor. I had, she talks about uh, re-engineering your brain basically, but also same experience you had through meditation and uh, not just simple vision boards, but kind of action boards. What would you like to, how do you want to see yourself uh, change? So we're really, really out of time, but um, one more question is, how can I measure my emotional intelligence and intellectual intelligence at the same time? I don't know why this person wants to do it at the same time. And uh, it's one of our team members. Thank you, Gilberto, for joining us. I know you go all the way through math sort of brain equations and hopefully we'll have you back in our webinars. 
Um, would you necessarily want to see these measurements at the same time, or? Well, I, I'm sorry. Can you can you read that's kind the of question? Uh, how do I want to? How can I measure basically my emotional intelligence at the same time with my intellectual uh, intelligence? I guess uh, IQ versus EQ. Yeah. Well, again, he he would know, right? He's the scientist. I know. He's um, just uh, he's the, triggering us. He's, <laughs> yeah. I, and I, what I've heard, right, is that there are ways to measure, you know, hormonal inputs, right? Like there are ways to measure. Um, I, and I'll give you another quick example. I had heard this is just more of an anecdote, right? There's a part of the brain that, uh, part of the amygdala, I believe, that mm -hmm. measures um, spatial orientation, right? And they've done studies on the black cab drivers in London, right? Because the black, in order to be a black cab driver in London, you have mm -hmm. to pass a very rigorous uh, geography test, basically, so that you know how to navigate the very weird street layout of London, right? Mm -hmm. And so in order to become one of these cab drivers, you have to pass this test, and it's a very difficult test, but you have to know your way through London and the best way to navigate the narrow streets of that busy city. And uh, there was a study done a number of years ago that actually measured that part of the brain of these cab drivers. And they mm -hmm. actually had statistically significant more uh, gray matter or more, you know, larger yeah. um, parts of the brain than uh, than people who were not cab those cab drivers, right? Because they use that part of the brain more than uh, somebody who's not a cab driver in London. And so that could be that could be a way to begin to measure. Uh, now that's going to measure. You know, it's not going to necessarily measure how good. You know, how quickly I can navigate or how happy I might be as I'm trying to help you navigate as your how driver. About being a woman and trying to pass that test, there is no way we can. <laughs> being a bit biased here, but my personal experience, that's how it is. But it would be interesting to challenge ourselves and increase our gray matter, become a cab yeah. driver. Um, so one point I want to, before I thank you for actually sharing the presentation that was also part of Lean Six Sigma, so that's great to have it here as well, a good reminder of what uh, we need to do consistently. And um, I'm also happy that you mentioned the biological part of it. We had that meeting, the team meeting, leadership meeting we had about two years ago, when we spoke about changing our body of knowledge and actually including the biology part of leadership. Uh, you mentioned the hormonal level uh, the part and honestly i have thyroid issues and i think like many times those trigger me to be a bit more type a personality than in certain other moments and i feel like uh that has changed through treatment i feel like we do need to bring the biology into it or what you mentioned about exercising and changing our lifestyle things that actually change our genes so that's uh that's an area that we we're happy to start exploring. So I'm very happy that you shared and you brought that and included that as part of this webinar. I do want to point out that we do have um, already our next presentation. We'll have actually Kieran talking next month. So that's great to have our team members starting to contribute on a content base as well. We will be talking about uh, how is actually connected employee retention with achieving greater results. I feel like we focus so much on leadership and everything, but then we also want to see what happens if we don't focus? What's the impact? And having employees leave a company, that's a very tangible uh, failure. So we do need to see if there is any linkage between those two. Yes, there are credits as usual. I see many questions about that. So I'll be sending an email uh, within tomorrow, if not today, um, for all those who have attended about 40 minutes. I know many of you are still in here, which is great. So if you have other questions, we can share uh, Richard's LinkedIn profile. We'll be sharing the presentation as well. So thank you for joining and we'll be very happy and excited to have more about your questions next month as well. So thank you, Richard, so much. And thank you, thank Karen. You. Take can care. You about, if I can add, uh, you know. She's not uh, here, did, so yes, we, you can. <laughs> yeah, no, we did get a little bit late. So our uh, yes. apologies from the group and appreciate everybody staying back and listening to all the goodies Richard has shared. We're just testing Thank your you. emotional intelligence, so Thank don't you, get Richard. cranky. It was really awesome. Thank you. Thank you, and great seeing everybody. And thanks for your participation, and thanks for your help, Sadita and Kieran. Anytime. Thank you, Thank you so Thank much. You. Take bye. care. Bye. Okay. Bye bye.